Good evening. Uh, we are going into the second part of our chapter, Laws of Motion. And we start today's class with the topic, Impulse. Impulse. Okay. Now, imagine you are playing football. Okay. So, you kick the football. And as you kick the football, you apply a very large force for a very short interval of time. The product of this, that is, the large force you apply multiplied by the very short interval of time for which this force was applied, that product is what you call as impulse. Now, um, as you know from, or imagine the case where you are hammering a nail into the wall. So you take the hammer and you hit the nail for a very short interval of time with a very large force. The product of this large force multiplied by the very short interval of time for which it is applied, that is what you call as impulse. And from Newton's second law, we know that the force is the rate of change of momentum. I hope you remember from last session, the momentum P is equal to the mass into velocity of the body. So, this may be written as delta P by delta T because Newton's second law says the rate of change of momentum is the force. So, we know now that this delta P is actually the impulse, which is a change in momentum of a body, the mass into velocity. So, you may say this is the final momentum minus the initial momentum. So, when you apply this force, what happens is, when you apply a force, there is a net external force acting on the body, because of which there is an acceleration, which means there will be a change in the velocity of the body. And the final momentum minus the initial momentum will give you the impulse. If you look at this, you know that impulse must also have the same SI unit as momentum. Momentum SI unit will be kilogram meter per second, which is the same for impulse. Or from this, you may say Newton second is also the SI unit for impulse. Okay. Now, we go on to our next topic, that is law of conservation of momentum. Law of conservation of momentum simply states that the uh, momentum of a system will remain a constant if the net external force acting on the isolate, if the net external force acting on the system is zero. Such a system is what you call as an isolated system, meaning isolated system is a system where the net external force acting on it is zero. So when the statement, when you state law of conservation of momentum, you may state it this way, the uh, momentum of an isolated system remains a constant. Isolated system is when the net external force acting on the system is zero. Now, let me explain this with an example. Suppose we have two balls of mass M1 and M2, which are moving in the same direction. So, we have a mass M1 moving with initial velocity U1. Another mass M2 moving in the same direction with initial velocity U2. Let them collide for a, for a moment and then continue in their same path with a new velocity V1 and the second one's final velocity, let's take it as V2. They continue to move in the same straight line. Now, before collision, the total momentum of this system of two balls was Momentum of this body is what? Mass into velocity plus momentum of this would be mass into its velocity. So total momentum before the collision of this system of two balls is M1 U1 plus M2 U2. This must be equal to the total momentum of that system after collision which is M1 V1 plus M2 V2. So before collision and after collision the total momentum of this system remains the same. Now, here, actually this um, Newton's second law and Newton's third law leads to this law of conservation of momentum. Let's see that with an example. Imagine we have a bullet being fired from a gun. Okay. I'm not really good at drawing, but anyway, let's see. This is your gun. And we have the bullet being fired in this direction. Now, what does Newton's third law say? Every action has an equal and opposite reaction, which means if the bullet is moving forward, that is, the force exerted by the gun on the bullet, let me call it as Fb. 
then the bullet must also exert a force on the gun in the opposite direction which is the force on the gun due to the bullet but Newton's third law says every action has an equal and opposite reaction which means Fb must be equal to minus Fg right because they are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. Now Newton's second law says rate of change of momentum is this force. So momentum of the bullet must be Fb into delta T and momentum of the gun must be equal to minus Fg into delta T. Now this Fb and Fg are equal in magnitude, only thing they are opposite in direction. They interact for the same interval of time. So you may write that Pb is equal to minus Pg, that is uh, they are, the momentum is also equal but opposite in direction. Or I may write Pb plus Pg must be equal to 0. So before firing, before the bullet was fired, the gun and the bullet were at rest. Both of them were not moving. So the momentum of the system before firing, the momentum of the system was what? Total momentum of the bullet and the gun together was 0. After firing, the bullet moves in one direction, there should be a jerk on the gun in the backward direction. So the total momentum of the system will be equal to 0. This is a law of conservation of momentum. Okay, then we will now go on to our topic on friction. The first kind of friction that we are going to talk about is called the static friction. And after which we will go on to talk about the kinetic friction. So we are discussing about static friction now. Static friction which I denote Fs. We also have kinetic friction uh, denoted by Fk. Okay. So here let's look at this. I have a book here and I am keeping another book on top and now I am going to apply a force on this book. Now I am going to apply the force but you will see still the book is at rest. Which means the net external force on this book must be zero. Because if there is an external force it would have started moving. So that means if I am applying a force in this direction. There must be some opposing force opposite to this applied force. Which is equal to the applied force. Because of which the net force on this book is zero. And that is why the book is still at rest. So this opposing force when the body is at rest is what you call as static friction. So the static friction it should be see let's say we have this body here we, we have the book here I'm applying a force applied force in this direction if the body is still remaining at rest then we must have a force which is opposite to the applied force but this is Fa and Fs are equal but opposite in direction and that is why the book is still at rest. So this force which comes into play when a body is at rest which opposes and this is a parallel, it is a contact force because this uh, kinetic, uh, sorry, static friction is a force which is parallel to the two surfaces in contact and is opposite to the applied force. So it's called a contact force because this force of friction is parallel to the two surfaces in contact and it opposes the applied force. And this is found to be proportional to the applied force because if I go on, see, if I go on increasing this applied force, you will see the book is still at rest, which means that as I increase the applied force, the opposing static friction is also going on increasing with it. Now, if I further up increase the applied force, it will reach a certain limit beyond which the body will now start to move. So, if I draw a graph where here I am plotting the applied force Fa and here I am plotting the frictional force. You will see as the applied force increases, the frictional force, the static friction also goes on increasing till you reach a maximum limit and that maximum value of static friction is what you call as Fs max. Once the, you reach that limit, 
then the body starts moving. Once the body starts moving, then the force of friction is what you call as kinetic friction. That is, the kinetic friction is the force of friction that comes into play when there is relative motion between the two surfaces. So if I am pushing this and the body is moving, there is relative motion between the two surfaces in contact. Relative motion means with respect to this surface, this surface is moving with respect to this. So there is relative motion between the two surfaces in contact and then that force of friction which comes into play is what you call as kinetic friction. It is found that this kinetic friction then remains a constant, does not go on increasing with the applied force. Static friction goes on increasing with the applied force, reaches a limiting value called Fs max and then once the body is in relative motion, two surfaces are in relative motion, you have what is called as the kinetic friction which opposes the motion of the body. So if your body is moving in this direction, the kinetic friction will be opposite to that and you will see that this applied force minus the force of kinetic friction will be the net force acting on the body because you have Fa in this direction, Fk is now not equal before Fs and Fk were same, equal but now Fk and F, Fa will go on increasing but Fk will remain a constant so there will be a net force acting in this direction which is what I call the F net. So F net will be this is more Fa minus Fk. So this is F net force on the body or I may write Fa minus Fk is equal to net forces M into A. So as you go on apply, uh, increasing the applied force, this acceleration of the body will increase. That is the velocity of the body will go on increasing. But this kinetic friction will remain a constant. So you may now write Fs is equal to a constant of proportionality mu s into sorry f s is found to be proportional to the normal reaction in, in initially i know this f s and f a were proportional as you go on increasing this f a applied force this f s is also going on increasing now it is found that this f s actually depends on the normal reaction as you know see suppose you have a body on the floor. You know its weight mg will act in the downward direction. Then there will be a reaction given by the flow which is what you call as normal reaction. Like if I am standing on the floor, my weight is acting in the downward direction. I don't sink in because the floor gives me a normal reaction which is equal to my weight but opposite in direction. So you may say this n is actually equal to the weight of the body but the two are in opposite directions. So it is found that the static friction is directly proportional to the normal reaction which is actually true because see suppose um, you have a chair and you are trying to push the chair. Suppose you have somebody sitting on the chair and you are trying to move it. You know that you will have to apply greater force in order to get the chair to move when there is somebody sitting on it. So that means greater the weight greater will be the static friction. So Removing this constant of proportionality, this is mu s into n and uh, similarly here this is equal to mu k into n. So from this you will see that what does the force of friction depend on? Force of friction depends on first the normal reaction that is the weight of the body. Greater the weight, greater will be the uh, force of friction both static and kinetic. Um, uh, it is, and uh, it does not depend on the shape of the body. Meaning, force of friction does not depend on the area of contact. Like, let me say, the weight of a body is, let's say, 10 Newton. Okay? Now, this body could be in the shape of a cuboid. It could be in the shape of a cylinder. It could be in the shape of a flat uh, circle. Whatever. It if the weight of the three shapes are the same, that is, if you have the same 10 Newton in the form of a circular disc, in the form of a cylinder or in the form of a cuboid, the area of contact is different, but the weight is the same. But force of friction will be the same independent of the area of contact, depends only on the normal reaction, that is the weight of the body. It also depends on the coefficient of friction. This coefficient of friction is the dependent on the nature of the two surfaces in contact. 
Now, like I showed you, we have these two surfaces in contact, right? Now, these surfaces, if you take a microscopic view, you will see that they have small irregularities like this. And because of these irregularities between the two surfaces, there will be an interlocking between the two uh, irregularities on the two surfaces. And it is this interlocking that causes friction. So, if it is a very rough surface, uh, like let's say sandpaper, if, you have, um, if I'm trying to slide this book on a sandpaper, you know that the interlocking will be more and because of that the friction will be larger. And so the coefficient of friction will be larger in that case, rough surfaces. Instead, if I was trying to uh, move this book on a smooth glass table, then the interlocking is much lesser. And because of that, the reduce, there will be a reduction in the friction. So friction depends on the nature of the two surfaces in contact. It also depends on the normal reaction. It does not depend on the two things. One, independent of the area of contact. Also independent of the velocity of the body. Because I told you, as I increase the applied force, what is happening? The force of friction, kinetic friction will remain a constant even though there is acceleration. So the body is increasing its velocity because the net force will increase since you are applying a larger force. But kinetic friction will still remain a constant independent of the change in velocity of the body. So it does not depend on the velocity of the body. So these are the things I wanted to discuss with you under static friction and kinetic friction. We also have our last topic on rolling friction. See, rolling friction is the friction that comes into play when a body rolls on a surface. So, pure rolling motion would mean that, let's say, we have a ball rolling on the floor. Okay. So, if we are talking about pure rolling motion, it means that at one particular instant, there should be only one point of contact between the two bodies. So, in the next moment as it rolls, the next point will come into contact with this surface. So, as it rolls, at one particular instant, only one point of contact between the two surfaces and the velocity of that point must be equal to zero. So, pure rolling motion is when there is just one point of contact between the two surfaces. But in actual practice, see, suppose we have a heavy vehicle which is traveling on the road. We have this uh, road. You will see that there will be a slight deformation of the road when this heavy vehicle is passing on the plain road. Now, this deformation is actually temporary because once it rolls away, then it will come back to the plain surface. So, when there is a slight deformation, you will see that there is a small area of contact between the uh, tire and the road. And this contact force, this area of contact, the force which acts opposite to the direction of motion, that is what you call as rolling friction. So there is, while it rolls, on this small area of contact, there is a contact force which is opposing this motion. And such a force that opposes the motion while a body is rolling on the surface is what you call as rolling friction. This rolling friction is lesser than static friction or lesser than kinetic friction and that's obviously why you would attach wheels to your trolleys because without wheels if you are trying to slide the trolley it, it is a case of kinetic friction but instead if you put uh, wheels on your trolley it is a case of rolling friction and rolling friction as you know is lesser than kinetic friction. So that is why we fit um, wheels on to the trolley. Also, between different machine parts, you will see small ball bearings. Why do you use ball bearings? Because these ball bearings produce rolling friction. Rolling friction is much lesser than kinetic friction. If you allow those machine parts to slide one over the other, then it is a case of kinetic friction, which is larger than uh, rolling friction. And friction, as you know, has a great disadvantage. It dissipates energy in the form of heat. So, between different parts of the machine, if there is sliding friction, then there is a lot of heat produced and you are simply wasting energy in that form. So, to reduce this friction, what you can do is use ball bearings because of which it will be a rolling friction, thereby you are reducing friction. Or you may use a lubricant, like you can oil the parts. When you oil the parts, what are you actually doing? You are applying a lubricant between the two surfaces 
and when there is a lubricant then the uh, interlocking between the two surfaces will be reduced and that's why lubricants always reduce friction then um, you have a great advantage too for friction because suppose you are walking on the floor and uh, how do you move forward according to newton's third law every action has an equal and opposite reaction so if you need to move forward as you press the floor down backward the floor will give you a push in the forward direction and that is how you are moving forward so similarly if you want to start a car as you start the engine the wheels are now pushing the road backward so that the friction of the road will now push the car forward so you need friction for your car to move forward or for you to walk forward without friction see suppose there is oil on the floor or let's say soap water on the floor it's a lubricant and if you try to walk you'll slip and fall because you don't have friction between the feet and the floor same way if your let's say your tires are very old and uh, it does not have the necessary friction then it will simply keep uh, rotating without having the necessary push to move forward and this push is given by the friction between the tire and the road so you see there are cases where friction is actually an advantage also uh, friction can also be a disadvantage but we know there are methods to reduce fris friction now there is also uh, a method to find out how you uh, the coefficient of friction of a surface you know what an inclined plane is an inclined plane has two arms the one arm is horizontal on the floor the other arm you can raise like this so here let's say the two arms of the inclined plane make an angle theta so this arm is on the floor horizontal and i can slowly raise this arm in the upward direction with respect to this let's say this arm is now making an angle theta so now you have placed a box on this arm so initially the box is here and as you start raising it you know that slowly this will now just start begin to slide down when it just starts to slide down you will stop and that is the angle theta so this angle theta is the angle when the box just starts to slide down now the weight of the box will always act in the downward direction which is mg normal reaction i told you is always perpendicular to the surface so your surface is here normal reaction is always perpendicular to the surface if i'm standing on a horizontal surface normal reaction is upwards otherwise normal reaction should be perpendicular to the surface now if this is so now let me draw this now this will also be theta because this is a 90 degree angle so naturally this must be 90 minus theta right this is theta this is 90 so this angle has to be 90 minus theta now this whole angle being 90 this has to be theta because 90 minus theta plus theta will give you this total 90 now if i'm resolving so if i'm going to resolve this mg in the two components this will be the adjacent component which is the mg cos theta and we have the uh, opposite component which will be the mg sin theta so this mg resolve that mg cos theta the adjacent and the opposite that is the mg sin theta now if this box is just about to start sliding we know that we have a force of friction which is always opposite to the motion of the box so if your box is now going to slide down then the force of friction is just going to be opposite to that now from this i may write see this box is not moving in this direction at all it is not moving up or down which means this n must be equal to the mg cos theta so i may write n is equal to mg cos theta which is my first equation now in this case the box hasn't started to slide out it's just about to start sliding in that particular moment the two forces must be equal so i may write the force of friction f is equal to mg sin theta force of friction as you know is mu times n the coefficient of friction mu into n is equal to mg sin theta which i take as my equation 2 if i divide 2 divided by 1 this mg and mg cancels sin theta by cos theta 
will give me tan theta equal to this divided by so n gets cancelled and you have mu which tells you that tan theta will give you the coefficient of friction so how can you find the coefficient of friction between the two surfaces just go on raising this arm till the box is just about to slide find theta tan of theta will give you the mu that is coefficient of friction between the two surfaces this theta is what you call as the angle of repose angle of repose okay so today's class we discussed we started with our topic on impulse went on to law of conservation of momentum and then we discussed uh, static friction kinetic friction and rolling friction thank you and good night